Coming up on this episode of Typology and Prophecy. There are some who have a favorite book of the Bible. Others have a favorite text. Myself? Well, I have a favorite word. For me, this word is so powerful that if you had to narrow the entire plan of salvation from Genesis to Revelation down to just one word, this word would be that word. Welcome to Typology and Prophecy. My name is Kyle. This is a podcast dedicated to the study of the Bible through the methodology of typology. So my favorite word in all the Bible is Emmanuel, which according to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23 is translated God with us. Today I want to talk to you about this concept of God with us specifically through the lens of the tabernacle that God instructed Moses to build in the wilderness. In Exodus chapter 25, starting in verse 1, we read, Then the Lord said to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. From everyone who gives it willingly with his heart you shall take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take from them, gold, silver and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen and goat's hair, ram skins dyed red, badger skins, and axia wood, oil for the light, and spices for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense, onyx stones, and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. Now what is Moses going to do with all these offerings? God says, and let them make me a sanctuary, and for what purpose is the sanctuary to be built? That I may dwell among them. So there it is, God's stated purpose for why he instructed Moses to build the tabernacle in the wilderness. It was for the express purpose that God may dwell among his people. In other words, Emmanuel, God with us, This is the central theme of every typological symbol found in the tabernacle that Moses built. And because of the tabernacle's typological connection to the plan of salvation, i.e. the gospel, I would also argue that the central theme of the gospel itself is likewise God with us. Okay, so there on your screen is a diagram which outlines the three divisions of the tabernacle and the furniture that is contained in each division. Right now, I want to focus on just the outer court. There are two objects, as you see there. We have the laver, which contain the water, and we have the altar of burnt offerings, which contain the fire. Now, even though this wasn't a permanent object in the courtyard, we cannot forget this little guy, the lamb, which of course was the primary sacrifice that made all this function as it was intended. So what do we have here? Well, we have blood that comes from a lamb being sacrificed, water, and fire. I would argue that these three, that they are symbolic of the Exodus and the Old Covenant. Passover was instituted in Egypt when the death angel passed over the homes where the blood of the lamb was stained on the doorpost. After they left Egypt, they came to the Red Sea, i.e. the water, which God parted in which they passed through. And finally, 50 days after leaving Egypt, they came to Mount Sinai where God descended upon the mountain in, you guessed it, fire, And the people entered into covenant with him, saying, All that the Lord has said, we will do. Now most of us, when we think about this lamb here in the courtyard, we tend to think of it in terms of the new covenant, as in Jesus dying on the cross, which is legitimate. However, before we can make this typological leap to the new covenant, we need to understand two important things. One, the covenants are spoken of by Paul as being equivalent to a last will and testament, which means they do not go into effect until after the death of the testator. 
He wrote in Hebrews, For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. But the testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. In plain language, the new covenant was not in effect until after Jesus died. Which means, and this is our important point number two, Jesus lived his entire life here on earth, up until his resurrection that is, under the old covenant. In other words, I would argue that Jesus is the God with us of the old covenant. And furthermore, as it relates specifically to the tabernacle of Moses, Jesus is the God with us of the outer courtyard. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, in my last video, I talked about this verse and why it is so important to understand the typological relationship that exists between Jesus and the Old Testament. I'm not going to repeat all of that here, but what I will say briefly is this. The incarnation and the death of Jesus, these both, before they became the substance of the typology of the new covenant, they were first the fulfillment of the typology of the old covenant. If we want to be accurate theologically when talking about what the new covenant is, then we have to define what it is by using language that describes how Jesus fulfilled the typology and prophecy of the Old Covenant. For example, let's consider the typology of the outer courtyard. Again, we have the lamb, the laver, and the altar of burnt offerings. At the beginning of his ministry, Jesus came to the Jordan River and was baptized by John. There is your laver, i.e. the water. Around the same time, it was likewise John the Baptist who declared of Jesus, that he was the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. There, of course, is our Lamb. At the end of his ministry, Jesus died the death of crucifixion as a burnt offering for the remission of our sins, thus fulfilling the symbolism of the altar of burnt offerings. Now that we have identified Jesus' typological connection to the outer courtyard, we need to establish how Jesus fulfilled the central promise for why the sanctuary was built in the first place, which is God with us. In John chapter 1, starting in verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Dropping down to verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God said to Moses, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. I believe that this is a three-part promise, of which the first part of this God with us promise is found in the typology of the outer courtyard, which I believe at this point should be fairly obvious, was fulfilled by the incarnation of God in Christ Jesus. But does this mean that the God with us promise came to an end? with the start of the new covenant, which saw Jesus after the resurrection return to heaven? I mean, how can we say that God is with us if Jesus is no longer here on earth, but rather up there in heaven? Well, let's answer that by moving on into the tabernacle building itself and considering the typology of the holy place. On the north side, we have the table of showbread. On the south side, we have the seven-branch candlestick. And there, in front of the veil, we have the altar of incense. Now, on the table of showbread, there was, you guessed it, bread. In fact, there were 12 large loaves of bread stacked up in two piles of six. But keep this in mind, the bread is not the only thing that was set there on the table. In Exodus chapter 35, in verse 10, we read, all who are gifted artisans among you shall come and make all that the Lord has commanded. For example, the tabernacle, its tent, its coverings, its boards, its bars, its pillars, and its sockets, those are the things belonging to the tabernacle, the ark, 
and its poles with the mercy seat and the veil of the covering. These are the things that belong to the ark. And now here's the part that's relevant to what we're talking about. Verse 13, the table and its poles, all its utensils, and the showbread. So in addition to the showbread, the table also had utensils. Now, what are these utensils, you ask? We find the answer in Exodus chapter 37, starting again in verse 10. He made the table of axia wood. Two cubits was its length, a cubit its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And he overlaid it with pure gold and made a molding of gold all around it. Now drop down to verse 15. And he made the poles of axia wood to bear the table and overlaid them with gold. He made of pure gold the utensils which were on the table. So in addition to the bread, the following utensils were likewise on the table. Its dishes, its cups, its bowls, and its pitchers for pouring. Here's another verse from Numbers that basically says the same thing. On the table of showbread they shall spread a blue cloth and put on it the dishes, the pans, the bowls, and the pitchers for pouring, and the showbread shall be on it. Now the thing I want to focus in on here is these pitchers for pouring, specifically what was inside them. You see, in the context of the tabernacle and its services, that which was poured out, which thus required pitchers for pouring, it is what is called a drink offering. Now here are three quick texts from Numbers chapter 15 that show us exactly what a drink offering was. Verse 5. And one fourth of a hint of wine as a drink offering you shall prepare with the burnt offering or the sacrifice for each lamb. Verse 7. And as a drink offering you shall offer one third of a hint of wine as a sweet aroma to the Lord. Verse 10. And you shall bring as the drink offering half a hin of wine as an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. Okay, so the conclusion here is that on the table of showbread, we have bread and wine. Now, what about over here with the golden lampstand? Besides the fact that there were seven candlesticks in total, we need to ask what was inside the lampstands because this is what they used as fuel to keep the lamps burning. We find the answer in Leviticus chapter 24, which reads, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring you pure oil of the pressed olives for the light to make the lamps burn continually. Okay, so the answer is olive oil. This is what they used as fuel to keep the golden lampstands burning. Now, based on the table of showbread and the golden lampstand, what we have established as the defining typology of the holy place is bread, wine, and oil. Now, the significance of these three is that they are the three typological symbols of the new covenant. Therefore, I would argue that just as the outer courtyard is connected to the old covenant, the holy place of the tabernacle is connected typologically to the new covenant. Now the connection between the bread and the wine of the holy place and the new covenant is of course in the Lord's Supper. We read, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine, i.e. the wine, from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. 
And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, as in amongst the trees that produce the olives that make olive oil. Now, of course, we know what the bread and the wine represent. As Jesus just told us, the bread is his body, i.e. the incarnation, and the wine is his blood, i.e. his sacrificial death on the cross for the remission of our sins. But what does the oil represent? Well, for one, just as was in the case of the golden lampstand in the tabernacle, the oil is the fuel we must have for our lamps, as Jesus taught in the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. He said, The kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. The parable concludes with this. Those who had oil went into the wedding. Those who did not have oil were shut out. So now we know where the oil goes and why it is important, but we still need to know what it represents. We find the answer in Zechariah chapter 4. It reads, And he said to me, What do you see? So I said, I'm looking and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it, and on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. Now later on in the chapter, he describes again the same vision, adding a little detail. Then I answered and said to him, What are these two olive trees at the right of the lampstand and at its left? And I further answered and said to him, What are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacles of the two golden pipes from which the golden oil drains? So these two olive trees are fueling the golden lampstands with oil. That's the symbol we're trying to decode. Okay, back to verse 4. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me, saying, What are these, my lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my lord. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So the conclusion is this. The oil represents the Holy Spirit. Now keep this in mind. We're talking about the Holy Spirit in the context of the holy place typologically representing the new covenant. So the question is, Do we find any other biblical support for drawing a line of connection between the golden lampstand in the holy place to the Holy Spirit's role in the church under the new covenant? I believe the answer is, yes, we do. In Revelation chapter 4, we read, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. Okay, I start with this verse. So we can establish where in the context of this vision we are at, which is clearly not here on earth, but rather up in heaven. Now he goes on to say this in verse 5, And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now this is not saying there are seven holy spirits, but rather that the one and only God, the Holy Spirit, is the fuel for the fire in each of the seven lamps that are burning before the throne. Now, let's compare this with what we find in Revelation chapter 1. It reads, I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was, now where is he at? On the island that is called Patmos, for the word of God, and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Okay, so just like the other passage did in chapter 4, which is that it told us we were in heaven in the context of that vision. However, in contrast, this text tells us that John in chapter 1 
is here on Earth, specifically on the island of Patmos. Okay, let's continue. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet. Now, where is this voice coming from? It's coming from behind him. And where is John? That's right, he's here on earth on the island of Patmos. I heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to who? To the seven churches, which are where? In Asia. To Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. In other words, Jesus came back to earth to speak to John so that John could share the revelation of Jesus Christ with the church that is still here on earth. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. Now, did John say that he left from where he was? No, he simply said that he turned around to see. So to be clear, we're still here on earth, where we started in the beginning of the vision. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. So John turns around and he sees Jesus standing in the midst of the seven lampstands. Now what do these seven lampstands represent? Verse 20, Jesus says to John, The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, And the seven lampstands, which you saw, are the seven churches. Now, what we have here is this. In chapter 4, we see seven lamps of fire in heaven that are burning before the throne of God. And these seven burning fires represent God the Holy Spirit. In contrast, here on earth, we have seven lampstands, which Jesus says represents the seven churches. Now, of course, it was Jesus' death on the cross that established the new covenant, which likewise established his church. Now, we can see from this text here in Revelation chapter 1 that there is a clear typological line that can be drawn from the holy place of the tabernacle to the church of the new covenant. In other words, the golden lampstands represent the new covenant church. Ah, but you see, there is still a problem. Because God said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. But with Jesus leaving earth and going back to heaven, and even in Revelation chapter 4, the Holy Spirit, symbolized by the seven lamps burning before the throne, he's in heaven. So does this leave the church void of this God with us promise? No, friends, absolutely it does not. Why? Because there was Pentecost, and there is what Jesus had to say in these following verses. Jesus said, But now I go away to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, Where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. Far from being a disadvantage for us that he is in heaven, Jesus says it is to our advantage. Why? Because the Helper will come in his place. So who is this Helper? Jesus said, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. And I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. In other words, we will not be orphans in the sense that we will not have to live in this world without the fulfillment of the God with us promise. You see, those seven burning fires 
before the throne of God in Revelation chapter 4, on the day of Pentecost, they came down to earth, and like God descended upon Mount Sinai in fire, God the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples with tongues of fire. We read in Acts chapter 2, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, then appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, this video is not about the topic of tongues, but for those who are interested, let me just state for the record that I believe that the biblical gift of tongues is when someone, because of the Holy Spirit, speaks another known, spoken, and understood human language. Basically, anyone who is bilingual, they speak in tongues. may not be a supernatural gift, but outwardly it is the exact same thing. Okay, so back to the main topic. What I'm saying is this. Jesus is the God with us of the Old Covenant and the outer courtyard. And the Holy Spirit is the God with us of the New Covenant and of the holy place of the tabernacle. Paul asked the question, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? You know, for many years I've referred to this as Emmanuel 2.0. Jesus was God incarnate in his own body so that he could become the second Adam. But that is not where God's grace ends when it comes to our salvation. No, just as God the Word came down and dwelt among us in the flesh, so does God the Holy Spirit likewise come down to earth and dwells in man, that man might become, as Peter says, partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So let's go back to our tabernacle chart here. We started with the outer courtyard, and we learned that Jesus was the God with us of the Old Covenant. Then we moved into the holy place, and we learned that the Holy Spirit is the God with us of the New Covenant. So that leaves us with God the Father and the Most Holy Place. In the most holy place, behind the veil that separated the holy and the most holy places, there was the Ark of the Covenant. Now what I want us to focus in on is what was on top of the Ark of the Covenant, which was the mercy seat. We read in Exodus chapter 25, You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its width. And you shall make two cherubim of gold, of hammered work you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherubim at the one end, and the other cherubim at the other end. You shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it, of one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be towards the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. Now, it is because of these cherubim that we read about that we know that the Ark of the Covenant, and probably even more specifically, the mercy seat itself, that it represents the throne of God in heaven. In Isaiah 37, it says, Then Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, saying, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God. So according to this verse, God dwells between the cherubim. 
This is repeated in Psalms 99, verse 1. The Lord reigns, let the people tremble. He dwells between the cherubim, let the earth be moved. Finally, we have Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 1, which reads, And I looked, and there in the firmaments that was above the head of the cherubim, there appeared something like a sapphire stone having the appearance of the likeness of a throne. So according to these texts, where God dwells and where his throne is, it is between the cherubim. That is what the mercy seat that sat on top of the Ark of the Covenant represented. It represents the dwelling place of God, and to be even more specific, we're talking about God the Father. Now, I want to talk about the dimensions of the most holy place. If you read through Exodus chapter 26, verses 15 through 25, which we're not going to read through them all uh, here for the sake of time, but if you do read through them and you add up all the boards that these verses talk about, and you do the math, what you come up with is a perfect cube. In other words, the most holy place is 10 cubits long by 10 cubits wide, and by 10 cubits high. So as I've said, we have a perfect cube. Now why does this matter? Well, it matters because of the following verse. God said to Moses, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show you, that is, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. So what is this pattern that God showed Moses, in which he was instructed to use as the blueprint for the construction of the tabernacle? Well, good thing for us, Paul addresses this in Hebrews. Speaking of Jesus, he wrote, For if he were here on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law who served the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is a mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. So we can see here from this verse that contextually Paul is talking about the same verse in question from Exodus 25.9, for he references it specifically. Now, with this in mind, let us start from the beginning of the chapter and read the first couple of texts that preceded the ones we just read. It says, Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. So Paul here equates Jesus being in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, as being in the sanctuary and the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. Simply put, this would mean that the mercy seat of the most holy place represented God's throne specifically. The totality, however, of the most holy place, as in the space itself, it then would represent heaven itself. This is confirmed by Paul again in the next chapter. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered, where? The most holy place, how often? Once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Verse 18. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop 
and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. Verse 23. Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into where? Heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God for us, not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Okay, so what this tells us is one, the pattern that Moses was shown was heaven itself. And two, the most holy place which the earthly high priest went into once a year on the Day of Atonement, Jesus at his ascension entered into the actual and the original most holy place that Moses was shown as the original to pattern his off of. In his sermon before he was stoned to death, Stephen interprets the relationship between the temple and heaven in the exact same manner as does Paul. He stated, But Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet says, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? Now let's go back to our chart here and recap. We have the outer courtyard where it was Jesus who fulfilled the God with us promise of the tabernacle. Then there is the holy place where God the Holy Spirit has and still is fulfilling the God with us promise. So what about the most holy place? How does or will God the Father fulfill the God with us promise of the tabernacle? Well, let's take a look at this verse here in Revelation chapter 21. Verse 14. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations. Okay, so we're talking about a city now. And on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, its length is as great as its breadth, and he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs, notice this, its length, its breadth, and height are equal. In other words, the dimensions of this city match exactly the same dimensions of the most holy place in the tabernacle of Moses. So again, back to our chart here. The outer court represented the old covenant. The holy place represents the new covenant, which we are still currently under. So what covenant does the most holy place represent? Well, I would call it the new heaven and the new earth covenant. Revelation chapter 21, starting in verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. So this is the same city that John later says has the exact same dimensions as does the most holy place. The new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, what? The tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, as in God with us, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, 
There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. You see, folks, this earth will one day soon be the dwelling place of God the Father. Of course, it will first be cleansed with fire and remade new. But think about this. The center of the universe, the very capital and throne room of our God and King, is going to be right here on our planet. Now that's what I call Emmanuel, God with us. Well, that will do it for this episode of Typology and Prophecy. If you stuck with me to the end, you are super awesome. Please leave me a comment down below and let me know what you think. If you were blessed, please smash that like button. And please consider supporting me by purchasing one or even both of my books. They're available on Amazon. Links are in the description and pinned comments below. Thank you for joining me today and God bless.